Hello everybody and welcome back to the new Mindscape. Today I'm going to talk about spiritual motivations and volunteering. You may remember, well maybe you were little children at that time, in 2008 there was a massive earthquake in Sichuan province in China. Because I have family in Chengdu and actually, well, every, everything was fine with my family, although part of my family, um, my in-laws, um, we couldn't we didn't know where they were for um, for a few days. Um, they lived north of Chengdu in a town called Jiangyo, and so we were actually quite worried. But anyway, everything was fine. So a few months after the earthquake, I went to Chengdu. And I was very surprised when I talked to taxi drivers and other people because I expected them to tell me horrible stories or tragic experiences about the earthquake. But that's not what they were talking about. The taxi drivers talked a lot about how they drove people for free during those days after the earthquake because they wanted to help. They didn't say something like, oh, it was horrible, I have to drive all these injured people around, or oh, I lost so much income those days. But actually, they sounded happy when they told me about their experiences taking people around and helping them. I could sense that during that time, just in those few days right after the earthquake, everybody was helping everybody else. People like those taxi drivers suddenly forgot themselves. Their only concern was how to come in aid, how to rescue people, or how to help people in small ways. So in a sense, they were just like what Mencius said about how you react when you see a baby falling into a well. And so as a result of, of these conversations, I decided to do a research project on volunteers in China. At that time, thousands and thousands of people from all over China had rushed to the site of the earthquake to help. And so two years later, in 2010, I went to do interviews in many volunteer organizations in China, including some active in the earthquake area. And there was one thing that surprised me. Of course, right after the earthquake, so many people went to the earthquake area to help to rescue the victims. And so they, you could say, they displayed their higher self rather than their lower self. If you recall our discussion of the dual nature of humanity. When people are directly faced with acute suffering, suddenly, the good side of people was expressed. But two years after the earthquake, I went to Hanwang, a town which was completely destroyed by the earthquake. And right next to the ruins of the town, there was a prefabricated refugee camp. All the inhabitants of Hanwang were living there until they could be moved to new homes. And so I interviewed the volunteers there. There were different organizations helping with the education of children, with giving psychological therapy, or with providing other types of social services. And at that time, two years after the earthquake when I went there, there were three organizations providing such services in the refugee settlement. What surprised me was that the three groups were all religious groups. One of them was Christian, and the other two were Buddhist. In the days right after the earthquake, when it had been on TV every day, everybody wanted to help. But a few months later, after nobody was really talking or paying attention anymore, only a few volunteers were still there. And very few stayed there for two years, living in cramped, crowded, prefabricated cabins for refugees. Some of them were recent university graduates. They had come and stayed there for two years. But the only people who stayed for such a long time 
were religious people. Well, I was surprised because, after all, in China, um, most groups, most social organizations um, are not religious groups. And it was, but it was religious groups rather than the other groups that stayed there. And one can think of a very, very, very large group um, that has far more members than any religious organization in China with much more political backing, greater organizational ability, and significant, far more material resources that could have easily sent volunteers there. But two years after the earthquake, I didn't see the volunteers of those other organizations. I only saw the volunteers of religious organizations. So I really wondered what could be the reason for that. I mean, religious groups aren't the only ones that teach people to be altruistic and to serve the people. Other groups do they say that too. So why is it that other groups weren't there, but religious groups were there, although they all share a belief in altruism and in serving others? And so I've discussed this with students in the class in previous years, and sometimes they answered that, well, maybe it's their spiritual commitment that compelled them to stay and act. Maybe their spirituality made them more empathetic, more willing to help people in need. Ordinary people wouldn't say that they live in order to help others. Instead, they'd probably say that they live to make money or something like that. But for many religious people, being moral is a huge part of their purpose of living. So perhaps non-religious people would attach more importance to their personal affairs that they need to deal with. And so, after a period of time, such people have to come back to their normal life. They wouldn't devote their entire life to helping people. So, my students said it's reasonable for non-religious people to go back to their lives after a period of time. But for some religious people, maybe they treated helping others as their objective in life. And I think that these answers point to a certain understanding of the nature of human beings. What should we be really doing in life? But certainly not all religious people are willing to devote themselves for years to volunteering in difficult conditions. But nevertheless, it's true that religious teachings, culture, and morality generally emphasize that even in your everyday life, people should do their best to help others and to serve their fellow beings. So. I started to think about that, and I interviewed many volunteers, and I talked to them about their different experiences. And I found that for so-called normal people, when we do something for other people, we tend to expect something in return. So perhaps this is at the level of conventional morality, as I discussed in a previous video. Marcel Mauss, a French anthropologist, developed a whole theory of the gift, of the exchange of gifts, of helping and favors between people. So on the, other, on the one hand, people, human beings, are generous. They're always doing things for other people. But, just like in the practice of guanxi in Chinese culture, usually when people do something for others, they expect that later on the favor will be returned. So, at least, if you do something for others, the others should express their gratitude. So, in all cultures, there's a notion of reciprocity. We're generous to others, but we expect others to be generous back to us in return. We expect people to reciprocate, either right now or in the future, either through help or through gratitude. Well, what happens in volunteering? Well, I'm sure that many of you have had volunteering experiences or will have. And, you know, for a while it can be interesting, but no matter how many good things you do for others, at some point 
Some people might not be grateful. They might even take advantage of you, or they might even laugh at you or even scold you. Or simply you might not see an obvious positive effect of your efforts. You might even get official or bureaucratic problems that stop you from doing the good things that you want to do. It's so much trouble. So if you're expecting, consciously or unconsciously, something in return from the people that you're helping or from the society, well, sooner or later you might be disappointed. And this is why people who are at that level of motivation, of conventional morality, they'll gradually lose their interest in volunteering. But for people who are engaged in a spiritual path, if you do something for other people, you don't expect something in return from them. Somehow, the reward or the benefit will be a spiritual one. So in Buddhist language, it's called gongde, it's called merit. You're accumulating merit by helping people with a pure motive. So you don't expect anything in return from the people you help because you'll actually benefit spiritually. If you have selfish motives in helping others, you won't gain merit. In fact, you might even lose merit. Or in other religious terminologies, by doing good blessings, by doing good deeds, you gain blessings, you come closer to God, you progress spiritually. There's always the idea that the benefit you get from good deeds doesn't directly come from the people you're helping. There's, in a sense, a third party. There's God or the spiritual reality. So when you do something for another person, you actually gain something. You gain something not from that person directly, but from God, from the operation of Dharma, from the spiritual reality, and you grow spiritually. So people who follow this spiritual logic may be able to persist in volunteering for a longer period of time. It might be easier for them to overcome the obstacles that they encounter when they're helping people, because they don't expect anything in reciprocation from the people they help and they'll actually make spiritual gains. And so it becomes easier for them to become detached from their material needs because they let go on the material side and they feel that they gain on the spiritual side. Now some people may feel that this kind of thinking is still kind of selfish because you want to gain spiritually. And so maybe that exists at some level, but then in these... Um, in this spiritual thinking, actually, um, the gain is more of a side effect. Actually, if you still are doing something for others because you want to gain gongde, you want to gain merit, or you want to gain blessings, then actually you wouldn't gain those blessings. So the benefits, in a sense, they come as a, a side effect of acting with a pure heart without expecting anything in return. So the less you expect something in return, actually, the more you would actually gain from it. So <laughs> it's kind of paradoxical. So for some of the Buddhist volunteers I um, interviewed, some of them were, men were members of a Taiwanese group called the Tsuji Gong De Hui, the Tsuji Buddhist Compassionate Merit Foundation. And actually, what's interesting about that, about them, is that they, not only do they help people, but they thank people for accepting their help because they consider that the greatest blessing in the world is to be able to help other people. So from their perspective, it's not the volunteers who are doing a favor to the people that they're helping, but spiritually, it's the people who are being helped who are actually doing a favor to the volunteers. So one can grow spiritually by helping people, by becoming selfless, and by overcoming the ego. So from this perspective, if you're given a chance to help, it's wonderful because being able to help is a huge gift. So people in Siji don't ask for anything in return, but only the chance to help. They thank people for giving them the opportunity to love and to share.